For the things that we have attained the last month, so far we have to the year. I don't know if you have really done whatever you wanted to do in the first half of the year, the plans you had at the beginning of the year. Are you halfway those plans? If not, why not? Are we just lazy? We have setbacks. It's time to sit back on the brain board and see how to go about this last half of the year. So I'm grateful to God that you have gone back on the year and continue to pray that as we begin this new month, we we'll need to bless us and our plans, our aspirations, and our desires. This has been started for the right time. In the gospel, here it is the same. If we now have father or mother, son or daughter, more than him, we are not worthy of him. He's just telling us that love our loved ones. No, he says, if you love them more than me, for see, our families that we must love our parents, we must respect our parents. That is Matthew 15, 3 to 6. He affirms this. We ought to care for them, as we should. But for us to understand this better, let us use the human scenario. Couple, husband and wife. If you are in your home, and your heroes are the ones deciding for your home, your wife or your husband will be fed up with it. I'm here, I won't make decisions as us. Why is it your parents and your relatives not coming to make decisions for our family? Are they more worth than me and our family? It's not that your wife or husband are not want to love your in laws, but that they have their part, their portion of what they should do and what they should not do. And if they go beyond that, they're interfering with your own family. And this is exactly what this is telling us. That we love, if we love our parents, our relatives, our friends more than you, then we are not worthy of him. They are going beyond their limits, beyond their borders, beyond their boundaries. If our faith is based on our ties with our relatives, with our friends, then we are not worthy of being disciples of the Lord. We must be able to put a foot down and say, no. As a believer, though you are my mother, though you are my father, you are my brother, you are my sister, you are my son, my daughter, I cannot do this. But of late, we do things, we go out of our way and we fall into sin knowingly, willingly, because of the times we have, because of the relations we have. You know, this is my wife, she's my wife, she's my husband, my daughter, my son. Let me just do this for you, all her. What can I do? We must be able to put the foot down and say, No, as a believer, as a follower of the Lord, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. Just because we have a relation between us, we are going to witchcraft, practice theft, corruption, then it. Only in the name of the relations we have. Of the relations we have. Are these relations between us in Brazil? And when they lead us in Brazil, are we actually worthy of the Lord? We are not, that's why he's telling us. If we put these relations first, more than our faith, then we are not worthy disciples of his. So, that's why he's telling the question Am I not the disciple of the Lord? Am I not the disciple of the Lord? Then he goes and he says, He who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Faith is not about very making and parties, they in and they out. No. Of life, we have this wrong perception of faith that is the type of process that faith is very making. Faith is about very making. It's not about having everything okay, 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 and the cross of Jesus, everything was done. Who told you? He was suffering in the garden of the testament. He was in fear, he was suffering, he was in anguish. He's going to die. And then he prays to his father, please help me take this cross from me. God did not. He didn't. He just strengthened him to carry the cross and go and do what he has to do. And that is what faith demands of us. At every thing, when we are believers, things should be okay, okay, okay. And then we are not going to raise God, raise God. He is there. He is there in the midst of the hardships and challenges. And he's calling you and you should carry the cross. We follow after him. That's how he crosses in the churches and our places where we stay. It's not just for play. It's not a decoration. It's a reminder to us on a daily basis that in our life we are going to face hardships, challenges, situations which are not easy on our side. But we must endure these hardships, we must endure these challenges when they come our way. We must persevere. 
but even at least his hardships and challenges remain firm, firm in our faith. If we don't do this, then we won't worry. Don't want the disciples of the Lord. Look at the apostles. They all want their battle to suffering. All of them. So if we are to be true believers of the Lord, who are the disciples of the Lord, we must be able to remain firm, firm in our faith and follow Him, even when things are not okay. When we just want to make things are okay, they're not worthy of Him. They're not worthy of Him at all. As He says, if you can't carry your cross and follow me, you're not worthy. And he says, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. At times, as I said, we want to have it easy and simple. Here we try to find life for the easy way out of things. And whenever we want easy way out of things, at the end of the day, things will not be okay for us. When we want it too simple, Everything should be too simple, it should come to me too easily. I want to relax. Then at the end of the day, you are going to suffer. I've been told the youth, look at your old age. Ask yourself, when well, God blesses you with old age, how will you be able to survive? When you can't run up and down, you can't sit 8, 11 hours at a workplace and do something. How will you be able to survive? Then ask yourself, okay, what should I put in place for me able to, to be able to survive in my old age? If you already have children, God forbid you die. How will these children of yours survive when you are dead? These questions, which are seemingly pointing us to the end or the worst questions in our life, help us to live better now. To make better decisions now. Not live a comfortable life now. So that in the end, we have it better. So what we're doing now, we will enjoy it. But then we those of us days in mind, it gives you the right direction, the right perception, a right way of handling issues. And what this is telling us. If you just want to find easy life now, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your life. At the end of the day, you're going to regret. I've wasted my time. I don't do what I had to do in time. And now I'm suffering. But if you lose your life, he says, for his sake. For the sake of faith, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of what is good and true, then you actually find it. Say, no, as a believer, I cannot do that. To others, you seemingly you are losing out and not taking part in the fun, in the joy. But then you are actually finding it. You are actually finding your life. Say, no, no, no. Don't let your husband treat you like that. You can't can we go out. You go out every weekend and every weekend and every weekend, your family dies off. It dies off. But then you say, no, I have to spare some time for my family. It's like you're dying off. You're doing this for something better. But he says, if you lose it for my sake. If you give up certain things, knowing that you're giving them up for something better, then you shall actually attend that something better. But if we don't think of that and just want easy life day in, day out, then we lose it. And that's also how we lose our faith. Because we cannot look at the thing and say, how is it going to be at the end of it all? Will I be able to survive this? Or will my faith remain intact? Will my morality remain intact at the end of the day? If I do this. That's why Paul, in the second reading, is telling us that in baptism, we die with the Lord and rise with the Lord. Therefore, let us die to sin and come to live like it is. But how do we die to sin? We enjoy sin. We enjoy sin. Do you know this thing? We enjoy sin. Whenever we sin, we have an apparent good at hand. And then we do not remember that it's just an apparent good. Sugar coated bitter medicine. We go to the other place, start to stay there, and we give them to us when we are small kids. And man is always saying, So eat quickly, so eat quickly, before the sugar is off. And who will be dying to sin? In our baptism, we have to die to sin. We have to die to these things. So we become worthy disciples of the Lord. We die off to sinfulness, to share a life in the Lord, a life in the Lord. Then he says, He who receives you receives me, who he receives me receives the one whom sent, whom, who sent me. That you are able to receive other people. Because of the good that 
we see in them, he talks of the prophet, a righteous man, even the least people, the little ones. He says, we shall share in their reward. We shall share in their reward. You see the prophet, you share the prophet's reward. You see the righteous man, you share in the righteous man's reward. You receive a little one, and give him just a cup, just a cup of cold water. You shall not lose your reward. This we have seen in the first reading. Prophet Elisha was just moving, going to his work, and then this woman notices him, talks to the husband, and says, Oh, this, this gentleman is passes here, and he's a person of God. Let's put a small shelter for him here so that he can rest on this long journey that he's always having. She did this out of a good heart, a loving heart. She's charitable, not with no strings attached. She didn't want anything in return. She, she did this out of a good heart. And then when the prophet stays there for some time, he asks his servant, This lady was very good to us. What, what do you think? We can do for her. I will uh, say, don't, don't ask. She's, she's aging, her husband is aging, and they have no son, they have no kid. He says, okay, go by him. He says, no, don't you worry. You will receive the son. You will embrace the son. When, when we help people, when we share with people their pains, their sorrows, you don't let it's hard for us to sit down and share the sorrow of someone else. You people are in your families and you can't even console your own husband and wife. You just want for this, I want this, I want that, I want that, I want that. And you can't believe really okay, is the situation actually favoring for us to get this. Did you see his pain? Do you see her sorrows? Do you understand what he or she is going through? Before you make demands to this person, that kind of compassion, this is the compassion this woman like the She says, no, 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 this man needs a resting place. So this is calling us to, 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 know, to receive one another, to receive one another. That when we receive each other, we receive him who sent him, that's called himself. And when we do this, we, we share a reward. We share a reward. This woman got a son. But when you are at understanding, when you have compassion to your wife, to your children, to your parents, then you receive the reward. Your family becomes happier. Yes, I have someone who understands me, someone who feels me pain. And there is more joy in the family. And then this is an immediate reward. And then the words come later on. When we are helpful to people, when we give that helping hand, and the question is, am I a disciple of the Lord? And if I am, do I actually stretch out my concern, my care to others as this woman has done for the Lord?